back. Tasty Crypto Show. I'm Ryan Grace here with the one and only Frank Caberna. That's right. One and only. I think I'm the only Frank Caberna. But Ryan, it's great to be here with you. You look beautiful. I can see right now the live feed and the camera look is like super high def. It looks yeah. great. In HD, finally, 2024. Here we are. We did it. New studio. It's the beautiful. Studio looks great. Um, wow. Transition. Now I'm now I'm I'm there. This is perfect. Boom. Unbelievable. This does actually look really good. <laughs> it looks really good. You always look great, Frank. Thank you, sir. And the coins are ripping. The coins are looking great. Best ever. Some are saying these are the, be the best ever coins. New all-time highs. Yeah. So we're going to jump into that here today. I've got some price targets for you that, um, I don't know, you're not going to want to miss it. So stay tuned <laughs> till the end. I'm going to talk about the Bitcoin halving here today, Frank, and what to expect. We are, by most estimates, a month out or so. Um, it's going to happen in April. Maybe it could be a little bit earlier than people have anticipated uh, in terms of when it occurs. But I want to talk about what's happened in the past when we look at Bitcoin halving cycles okay. to give us some framework. It's definitely not going to be perfect, but a framework for what we might be able to expect going forward. And well, I hope you enjoy this segment. Yeah, I, I think I will. Um, and I mean, if you've ever watched any Tasty Anything or you've done kind of like a higher level research on markets, um, I, I think you, you'll be you'll feel very at home with the research that you've put together. But it's just in a different space. It's the same as like, oh, like here's what normally happens on Google earnings. And it doesn't necessarily mean like this is what's going to happen this Google earnings. But it, it does give you a, a set of um, uh, essentially like a, a little backdrop of what could happen uh, going into it, which I, I think will be super helpful. And you even brought up off the show. I was like, don't waste any of this because you started going through. Yeah, we were going to talk about something else today. And, actually. And, you st and you started going through. You said fractals. And I was like, stop now. We, we need to do control. this. We need to do this on the show. So I'm I'm super excited. This is going to be uh, I I think a, a blast. And and obviously, I mean, uh, all time highs in Bitcoin. But at, at very least, op opinions aside, one of the most volatile times for this um, asset class that is is gaining momentum. And so for the upside or downside, so many things at play. And then you throw in this having thing, which I don't even know what it is. Uh, and it seems like it's like earnings on top of NVIDIA or something. It's crazy. Let's jump into it then. And we'll break down what this halving thing is. So let's start off with the basics of the halving. Before we get into price targets and talk about what to expect, what is this even? So what you need to know is that this is by design. This is part of Bitcoin. Every... 210,000 blocks, which is roughly about every four years, a block is produced about every 10 minutes. So roughly four years. The reward for mining Bitcoin is reduced by 50%. And this again is by design. So it's going to go from a current reward of 6.5, and it's gonna be reduced. So every block that's mined thereafter, the reward for doing that is cut in half. Miners receive less Bitcoin reward. So what ultimately happens when you think about this is the rate of change of the supply issuance or how quickly supply is growing, all else equal, that's going to slow down. Maybe that's bullish. It's part of the narrative. It's been very bullish in the past, or at least we've seen these cycles where we can point to outperformance. Um, as a result of the having, maybe there's a lot of other factors sure. that are ongoing. We'll talk about that as well. But this is by design. And certainly, I think people point to this contributing to um, what happens next in the markets typically after that, that point in time. And if you see something where demand also increases, I would argue it's pretty bullish, yep. given what you're really looking at is simply just the rate of change of supply, it's slowing down. There's ultimately going to be 21 million Bitcoin. How we get there, it's a slower pace as we go forward. Well, so I... I am there with you. I want to. I definitely want to go through the why because, yeah, that's. Uh, I, I, it is hard for me to grasp. It seems almost too simple to be like, oh, it gets the, 
the, the amount that you get is cut in half every so many blocks until essentially there is the amount of Bitcoin that there is, and that's that. Um, obviously, parallels drawn to gold, uh, precious metal or something like that, um, but even kind of more finite because essentially, are, are you telling me that it, at, at some point the amount of Bitcoin per block mined is zero. You don't get any more Bitcoin. In terms of the reward for miners, yes. Yeah. And then the reward would be effectively transaction fees Okay. at okay. that point. So there's this weird world in which Bitcoin dies if it isn't used. If well, everyone sits on it and there's no transactions taking place, there's no mining and there's no validation um, that's occurring or verification of transactions, right? You kind of get to this point where, well, it's not alive anymore. Well, because I wanted to paint the other, because all is well and good when Bitcoin is ripping through 70K and there's a growing demand. And so that maybe even expedites this, because uh, you say it's it, the, the halving is in accordance with the number of blocks. So it actually doesn't have to have this strict temporal element. It can, if there's more, if Bitcoin is 200K, and there's more, uh, you get more value for mining Bitcoin, they could start mining at a faster rate, essentially. But in, in those two things, like you said, you know, decreasing supply, gr increasing demand could lead to a very bullish Bitcoin and obviously kind of is right now. But I did want to paint the picture of the flip side is if Bitcoin gets down to under $100, obviously this is, you know, in terms of, context for right now kind of crazy but if it goes completely the other way and there's not a lot of demand and there's also not a lot of incentive to do the mining it could yeah this kind of system could cause it to never even see its its full potential well i guess what i'm saying there's a world where if no one uses bitcoin What's the point? Sure. Um, and there's really no reason or there would be a system in which you wouldn't be mining it. You wouldn't have transaction mm -hmm. fees. And so this kind of thing kind of falls apart. Exactly. In theory. Um, but in the meantime, you do see adjustments for difficulty. There's a lot of different mechanisms at play here. But I think if we get back to the why this happens, which is important, when you look at this, it's again by design. This contributes to this concept of Bitcoin as hard money or this pristine collateral, as people sometimes refer to it. This is something that gives us some predictability in terms of what's going to happen next, right? So maybe over time it's not as volatile. Um, maybe there's more faith in it as a currency, for example. But we have a view into what's going to happen to the overall supply. We have an understanding of the inflation dynamics as well, which we'll jump into here in a second. Very interesting stuff. But when you look at this compared to the alternative, fiat currency, it's not to knock fiat currency. We all use it every day. We price Bitcoin in it, yeah. for example. But it is not immune to central bankers coming out and debasing fiat currency. It's not immune to a sudden shift in the perspective of central bankers and a shift in monetary policy, whereas this is programmed into the code. There is nobody, there's no Jerome Powell that's going to come out and make a decision one way or the other that's going to have an impact on the network. And so that is important to understand, again, that it's by design that this gotcha. happens. And like I said, it's expected to happen next month. We've seen this happen a few times. We don't have a huge sample size when we jump into the data. It's also important to point out. But we do have some interesting takeaways, as we've had a few halvings previously in 2016, 2012, and 2020. So if I jump to the next slide, Frank, here's what's going to happen. And here's some numbers around where we are today. So the current reward is six and a quarter Bitcoin. It's going to drop to three spot, one, two, five after the halving again sometime in April. The inflation rate today, in terms of the annual growth of the supply, is about 1.7%. This equates to 900 Bitcoin per day. This gets us back to, when you look at the ETF flows, why that's been so bullish. Those flows have absolutely dwarfed the amount of new supply issuance. Very, very bullish outcome. And so that's where we are today, 21 million in existence in terms of the total supply. This is that scarcity element to it. Uh, you had brought up gold earlier. A lot of people can you know, obviously compare this to digital gold. 21 million by 2040. So quite a ways away if this continues. So 
the the time element of this has been pretty um like you you said it it's been happening every every four years um but that rate is essentially cut in half and then is it the same amount of blocks to until the next halving what gets us to the next halving yeah it's programmed in neighbor? roughly every 20 uh 210,000 blocks gotcha yep and what you're seeing is a block produced right now at a rate of about 10 uh, excuse me, um, every 10 minutes a block is produced. Gotcha. And so that's where we can estimate when that block is going to occur. That'll be the next halving. That's why it's a little bit, it's predictable in that sense. And so that's where you get this four-year cycle. Gotcha. But the cycle is really important. That's what I want to jump into. Cool. So let's look at some of these numbers because the ultimate question that everybody's trying to answer around this is whether or not the halving is bullish mm. on its own. We have certainly seen, you know, Bitcoin be very volatile at times. It's had huge upside moves. It's coincided with halvings. But I want to look at these cycles specifically and see if we can extrapolate what possibly could happen next, which is the fun here. And, and there's some things, too, that I'll point out. That, I mean, this is just a fascinating asset to me. But if we go back on the left hand side here, we have the dates of the halving and the price to the right is the price at that, that point in time. Sure. Um, maybe it was higher or lower during the day, whatever. That's the price that we have, uh, approximation of the price on the day of the halving. And then what we're looking at is where that price peaked, the duration of that cycle, and then ultimately the returns that you experienced had you been able to, to perfectly time the market. So I bought it on the halving and I sold the absolute top. Sure. What's my return? And also just looking at what's your return over a four year period? Um, because this, you know, that the peaks here, as you can see, have all occurred within two years. Mm. And then, you know, what also happens during these periods of time? The most fascinating thing to me about this, when you jump into these returns, is here's an asset that's been around for over a decade, has drawn down by 80% yeah. numerous times mm. over multiple, you know, four year periods, multiple cycles, and has still experienced returns on a four-year basis of, if we go back, all the way back to 2012, 5,000%, 1,300%, you know, close to 600% um, in the last halving cycle, after drawing down each time, you would have completely given up and lost all faith had sure. you not just been in this since the beginning, for it to only come back, um, not as strong, but to new highs. And, and, and also, I think it's worth noting that down 77%, in this this most recent instance, down seventy seven percent is not like um, not a lot of pain for up six hundred percent. Like Smash it's <laughs> like just because the number the absolute value is obviously smaller because you can only lose theoretically a um, hundred percent of whatever asset that you're buying. Um, but I just want to yeah hit that home with people that 77% or down 83 or 84% is like really as bad as it, as it gets, aside from obviously being down 99.99%, where essentially something goes to zero. Um, that's a lot of pain. That's a huge drawdown. Now, that being said, the, the fact that it's, to your point, able to <laughs> regain its prominence and over that same time period, over that four-year time period from one having to the next, um, return hundreds, if not thousands of percent, it is wild. It's, it's the, most, the most volatile major, at, like if you did a 10-year assessment of any other major asset class, you can't find anything as volatile as this. It's fascinating. Um... I don't want to say it gets easier, but I think if you've gone through a few of these cycles, it's definitely easier as an investor. Maybe it just speaks to my stubbornness personally. But I think it gets easier because you've seen this resilience at play in the markets and you've seen it come back. And you also probably have a much lower cost basis if you've been in it for some time versus where it experienced that drawdown from, right? Um, so we'll see if this continues or not. We only have three occurrences when we look at the sample size. But what we've seen here is, you know, certainly it's experienced a ton of upside after the halving. And maybe that's coincidental. But post-halving, 
the first time around, just massive returns to the peak, still 2,500% to the upside on the second halving, 600% roughly on the third halving. Roughly, call it about 500 days on average mm. if we take those three periods, the last couple of cycles. So if we use this information, what might we be able to interpret, I suppose, um, as to what happens with the next cycle? I think that's what's kind of fun here. Also knowing that, yeah, sure, maybe it goes down 80%. Sure. I have no idea. And where, what price it goes down from you know, is important there. But what I've done, Frank, very simple analysis here, is I've just looked at how much the magnitude of those returns in each halving has been dampened. Okay. So what we see roughly is about a 70% decrease in the magnitude of the return. Mm -hmm. And so where I'm going from is 87 to 25,000 or 2,500, 2,500 down to, to 600%. So those are my assumptions going into this. Clearly it matters what the underlying spot price is sure. at the time that you do this, but we're just gonna take the current price and, um, or actually I dropped it down when I ran this. So we're gonna use a price of 65,000. Let's assume that's the price on the, uh, the date of the halving. And let's assume that you were able to trade this perfectly and the way that the market kind of unfolded was very similar to what's happened in the past and you incorporate that 70% uh, dampening of the magnitude mm -hmm. of that return, right? So what might we expect then? No idea, again, we're not, trying to predict anything, just a framework for if you do see this happen or how to think about this maybe, sure. right? So if we just play this out, 178% uh, return, 500 day cycle, and that would take you from a spot price of 65 to 180 on the upside. Which honestly- Give or take a few grand, right? Yeah, and w which honestly seems, I don't know if it's the recent volatility in the market, but especially if you widen this out over several hundred days, Ryan, that seems actually totally normal. And by normal, I mean like normal distribution, like very within the bounds of what this market is capable of yes. doing. Um, and I, I guess another thing worth noting is uh, the small sample size, once again, just because I've, I'm someone who's done a lot of research on binary events, and, and this is obviously slightly different because it's a long-term kind of binary event, this having, um, though it might have a knee-jerk reaction one way or the other as it's happening, um, but a lot of the, the numbers that you just put together are essentially like what happens, this thing's been halved, now what happens while it's been halved, essentially over the course of potentially years. Um, and I've looked at this type of stuff, you know, years ago when you're talking about Amazon earnings, you remember a decade ago, and, and especially when it was newly public decades ago, were wild. Massive, like unbelievable swings. swings in that stock on earnings. And that would happen four times a year. And so, you know, if you widen out that lens, you're probably getting similar jumps of thousands of percentage points to the upside and, you know, essentially going down to zero potentially to the downside. When you have a small sample size like this, and I appreciate the fact that Bitcoin has gone from essentially being zero to now being over 70K. And with that, in percentage terms, your most volatile days are probably going to be that jump from zero to a few thousand, yes. unless this thing goes from 70,000 to several million dollars, which I don't see a lot of people calling for. And I only hit on that small sample size again, because I appreciate volatility has come in relative to those early days. And there is from first having to second having to third having a reduction in volatility. But with that small sample size, Anything is anything can happen. Yeah, Absol I think absolutely. Like you also have to be prepared for the outlier. Absolutely, anything where can this, happen. This this cycle <laughs> it goes down, and the having isn't bullish, and that narrative completely goes out the window. I think you also have to kind of mentally prepare for. Well, that. Not, and I'm not even necessarily getting at that. Of course, that's on the table, but also the upside of again potentially hundreds to thousands of percentage points to the upside 
is still very much on the table. Yeah, it is. You, I guess maybe the point is it's not too late if you think about it this way. And we're in no way saying like, oh, yeah, it's definitely going to 180,000. Absolutely. So I would think about it, though. I mean, if this does really start to run, which we're starting to see this run a bit, right? Um, I don't think it's insane um, by really any measure versus what we've seen in the past. Yeah, we might be a little overbought short term, mm -hmm. whatever. We'll see what happens here. But if it really does start to run, I think 100 is is there on the table. And what happens next? I don't know. Maybe this is a framework. If you see that this is actually playing out and you're 500 days in and we're 125, 150, again, just arbitrary numbers yeah, whatever. out there, it's fun. This is how I would think about it because the worst case scenario would be you ride this all the way up to some stupid value like this. Not stupid, but um, not like something many people right, not, yeah. not something many people are probably calling for. And it plays out like it did. And then it goes down 80% off of 180 or sure. one, 175, 150, whatever. It could even go down 50%. Maybe the volatility isn't as crazy to the downside, but you still just rode something from, I don't know, if you're buying it here, you ride it to 180, it gets chopped in half, and it's back down to 90. Yeah. Um, it can absolutely do that. The numbers are just bigger, but nothing else has changed. I think that's what's important to understand here. 100%. And... I mean, yeah, it's it's such a funny thing. It's like we're so close to this, and everybody is so close to this all the time, that from a day-to-day -day perspective, you just kind of look at it and you're like, wow, that Bitcoin's up another 5%. That's kind of crazy, unbelievable. Now, if you widen out your lens and you look at, I was looking at this earlier today, January of 2023, and the market is sub 20K, and if I were to tell anyone at that point, maybe not someone in the crypto sphere, but anyone. Everybody hey, else is calling us idiots. This, this market's gonna, and again, I'm not saying this in like a sense of like, uh, I mean, full disclosure, you and I are both long Bitcoin, but like, I'm not saying this in like a, oh, it's gonna go to some crazy price, but I'm only saying this market went from below 20 to above 70, and people aren't even really kind of yet being like, hey, this is crazy, but they are being like, oh, the Bitcoin's up another 5%. Isn't that kind of nuts? If you don't look at things, you know, with that wider lens, saying that something could move hundreds of percentage points seems insane until it happens. And I, I even pulled up, you know, of course, nothing is Apple. Apple is once in a lifetime kind of investment. But that's a stock that, yeah, if you look at any any stretch of a day or a couple of days in Apple, you could be like, oh, that was that's pretty good. It was up, you know, 5% or 10% that week or whatever. This stock is up in some years, hundreds of percentage points. Yeah. And you can throw other, other, there are stocks right now in the market that are moving hundreds of percentage points on monthly basis, bases. And so I, I guess, again, I call out that small sample size because yeah, this thing could evaporate and I don't think it's any coincidence that all of those numbers are down around 80% to 85%, which is essentially this thing going to zero but surviving. It can go, it can go to zero. But the potential for hundreds, if not thousands of percentage points is, is still very much a, a upside factor. And I mean that as much for someone who might be shorting and thinking there's only you know a couple hundred percentage points or 100% of risk. This is totally the Wild West. I agree with you. And I think you can see that very clearly as well when we look at Ethereum. So if we just pop up the Ethereum numbers for a second, it hasn't had as many cycles, right? It hasn't been around as long. But another roadmap, I suppose. Um, we go back to those halving dates. So July 9th, 2016, May 11th, 2020. What was the price of ETH? You can see how it's grown. You can see how the size of those rallies has grown. It is somewhat reminiscent of the cycles that Bitcoin has experienced at, at earlier stages of its, let's call it, lifetime. And so we'll see if this continues to play out. But you look at about a 40% decrease in the magnitude of those returns over these cycles. That gets you a you know hypothetical return of almost 900%. It's kind sure. of funny when you say it. 
And that would take you to a peak price of about $35,000 on Ethereum. Um, also kind of funny when you say it, but we it's have it's seen, we've seen that happen with Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin has done the same thing. I get that these are different assets and different instruments, but we've seen it before. I don't think it's, it's out of the realm of possibilities. But what, what I think is important to look at is then, okay, if that's the case, and we do think that Bitcoin can get to these levels, what would that be trading at in terms of the ratio when we look at the price of Ethereum in Bitcoin? Mm. And I'm getting, you know, almost, uh, what, spot two zero just about versus where we were. Um, so we've seen it, you know, close to a tenth recently. It's been as high as spot one five. But if you're getting to, you know, a quarter of Bitcoin and Bitcoin's 100,000, it's not hard then to see where you could get Ethereum at those prices. Doesn't mean it stays there, but it's within the realm of possible. Because, well, yeah, I, I want it because the 80 to 90 percent potential drawdown on this does put this market at, at 4K right now at a few hundred bucks, which I think, again, is very possible that you buy something here for 4K and it's a few hundred bucks at some point. We've in seen it go mid four to yeah. sub one last time around. Exactly. Right? We've exactly lived right. through this. Yeah. Um, but it's just fun. again, I love how today you widen out the lens, and because on a day-to-day -day basis, again, unless it's like literally this stock is up 200% today, which I don't even know if, uh, I, yeah, whatever. Um, people kind of get lulled into like, oh yeah, it's another 5%. Isn't that nuts? And before you know it, these things do move hundreds, if not thousands, of percent, or lose 80 to 90%. Is is craziness. Well, that's going to do it for our show. Frank, real quick, as we look ahead, Vol is at the highs. Bitcoin Vol, 84%, Ethereum, 86%, IV rank 100. There's your expected moves. So a 10% move in the price of one of these over the next week is entirely normal. <laughs> um, and that could be almost $9,000 in the price of Bitcoin, $500 when we look at the price of ETH. So I think the volatility, that was our prediction. Volatility would pick up quite a bit here this year. Uh, that's certainly been the case thus far. But that's going to do it for our show. We will be back on Wednesday. Victor Jones is up next with the price of truth. So stay tuned. Until then, this is the Tasty Crypto Show. I'm Ryan Grace. I'm Frank. Peace.